Hello everyone, today I want to talk about a book that I wrote a little while ago. I believe it was actually recommended to me by Ivan the Heathen. Uh, the book is 1939, The War That Had Many Fathers, The Long Run-Up to the Second World War by Gert Schultz Ronhoff. Here's a picture. Sorry, the sticker is covering the, the start of the title, but you can actually slightly read read that. So this uh, Schultz Ronhoff is a uh, was a general in the uh, army of the BDR of uh, West Germany. Uh, he's spoken at the um, property and freedom seminars that uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe puts on uh, at least twice, including this last year and the year before. Um, I hadn't actually watched his presentation until after I read the book. I think Ivan had mentioned the book to me a few times and I thought it'd be worth checking out. So this is definitely a very interesting book. Uh, I think it would fall into the category of revisionist history, although it's not relying on any kind of conspiracy theories or um, you know, there's there's a lot of evidence for everything that he points out. It's just very much a different perspective. The idea is that uh, Germany should not share sole guilt for uh, the start of the Second World War, that the narrative that uh, Hitler was a warmonger intent on war, that he wanted war, that he was trying to start a war is, is incorrect. Um, although it's certainly true that Hitler was willing to go to war to reach his political ends. His political ends, uh, he makes in the case in the book, at least when it comes to international policy, were understandable and uh, in in keeping with the times uh, and that he did what he could to avoid war uh, he does bear responsibility the point of the book is not to assert that um, Germany and I think it's important to realize that at that point in history the will of Hitler and Germany were largely synonymous or right, he was an absolute dictator by then he was very soon after he became the Chancellor of Germany and especially after uh, the office of the presidency was fused with the officer office of the chancellery, um, and the book lot goes through a lot of details about what what was Hitler's intentions, what was he thinking, uh, how much planning went into it in, into the start of the war. Um, he compares Germany with other countries, especially the England, France, Russia. Um, Poland, these other nations, and if you compare the actions of Germany with the actions of these other countries, it doesn't come out as uh, necessarily any worse. Uh, there was a lot of territorial exchange going on in the 20s and 30s. Um, a lot of it was based on military coercion. Uh, Poland here stands out as an example that had warred against all of its neighbors and had taken um, territory from all of its neighbors. But even Lithuania, even Norway, there are episodes in here that I'd never heard of, but Norway had actually conquered uh, Eastern Greenland for a time in the 30s. Um, Soviet Russia, um, Italy and Africa, I mean, France and England, the irony here is, you know, they claim to care about, uh, you know, stopping belligerent states. They had just completed, you know, a, a prolonged, century-long period of um, rampant imperial colonialism, where they had um, systematically taken huge chunks of the, of the world, um, much of it very violently, and even where it wasn't overtly violent, it was coercive, you know, there were threats involved. And Schultz, Ron Hoff kind of compares this to Germany and says what, you know, asks rhetorically, what's the big deal? Why is this so much worse? Um, so I don't want to rehash the entire history. Uh, it's covered very well in the book, but some very important points. Um, as many commentators have alluded to, a lot of this starts with the Treaty of Versailles after World War I. Um, and it's not unknown, it's not a secret, it's, it's fairly well known that uh, the Germans were very upset about this treaty and that it fueled Hitler's rise to power and that his domestic policy and his foreign policy uh, goals were related to basically undoing Versailles. And one thing that I didn't realize before I read this book is how justified a lot of the German anger over World War I was. Now, 
the first point, whether there's an important question of who bears responsibility for World War One, and I've read books about that, and I think that it's easy to look at that and blame basically all the belligerents to more or less degrees. The countries that deserve the most um, censure for World War One are probably Russia and uh, Austro-Hungary, uh, and then probably Germany, Germany and Serbia. And France would also probably be a top tier or second tier category in this, and England would be the least culpable, although even England would have some culpability. Uh, but after the war ended, um, there was still fighting going on. The armies of the German Reich were still uh, in foreign countries, in France, in Belgium. Uh, they were still in the field, they were still resisting. Uh, they were in a military catastrophe. Um, one thing that the revisionism that happened in Germany after the war was the idea that they were stabbed in the back, that the war was was going all, all right, and that um, they were still in a good position, and that, um, you know, uh, provocateurs back home, uh, malcontents back home are what rushed an armistice that shouldn't have happened. Um, that That is probably not a supportable conclusion. Um, the armies of, of the Kaiser's armies uh, were in the process of getting crushed and the material um, ratio between them and their opponents was getting ever worse. Um, so that's a little bit delusional. But when the Allies asked for an armistice, they asked, they asked that Germany would submit to an armistice on the basis of the 14 points that Wilson came put forward. Now, I'm not a big Wilson fan or a big Wilson supporter, one of the most overrated and terrible presidents. And the 14 points are not perfect or anything like that, but in terms of belligerence fighting a war, a very terrible war, 14 points is not a terrible basis on which to base an armistice. Um, there was a lot in there that could be considered lenient and fair. And so the Germans said, okay, if we're, we, we will agree to an armistice based on the 14 points. And so they agreed to an armistice. They disbanded their armies to a large extent. They demobilized. And the Allies immediately went back on their word. Um, the U.S. Uh, took exception to this, but did not force the hand of especially the French or the English. And immediately certain parts of the 14 points were eliminated. And one of them that was the most important was the idea of self-determination. Uh, Wilson was a big proponent of this, the idea that if you have a, a different ethnicity or a different nationality, that they, the people in a certain area should get to decide uh, what form of government that they have or what, what government they belong to. Um, and the Germans said, well, okay, that's fair. And then so Germans should be able to stay in Germany if they want or get that choice. And uh, the, again, especially the French, but also the English basically said, no, there is no self-determination for the losers. Germany is guilty of causing the First World War, so you are not entitled to any of the provisions of the 14 points. Uh, and so large numbers of Germans were cut away from uh, Germany, um, whether this was in areas that became Poland or areas that became Czechoslovakia, um, you had the state of Austria that was set up and there was a lot of people in Austria right from the beginning that wanted to join with Germany. They attempted to do so several times. They voted to do so several times and they were denied by the League of Nations and by the victors. Um, well, of course, it wasn't just the Germans. You ended up, um, uh, lots of Ukrainians and lots of Hungarians ended up in Poland, lots of Lithuanians. Um, since Poland hadn't been a state prior to this, Poland ended up absorbing I think it was about a third of its population were not ethnic Poles. Uh, and that doesn't even count all the Jews. Um, you had the Czechoslovakia was created, and even the name um, shows that you have got Czechs, but you also had Slovaks. They also had, um, I think the German minority was the second largest minority in Czechoslovakia. There was also a lot of Ukrainians, uh, some Polish people, um, and Hungarians. And... This caused a lot of problems in the post-war period, in the interwar period, uh, where you had these 
nation states run by one ethnic group or dominated by one majoritarian ethnic group and then populated by all these minorities. Now, I think that there are political systems that can accommodate this, but the nationalist central planning, the big government um, kind of uh, zeitgeist that was common in Europe at the time and everywhere for that matter, um, was not likely to work because you were going to have nationalist Czechs who looked at their uh, non-Czech citizens as subversive or a second class. Likewise, you would have Polish, nationalist Polish government viewing its minorities that way and on and on and on. Uh, certainly not something that the Germans were innocent of either. Uh, so, unfortunately, the population settlement patterns of the world are not so so simple that uh, political boundaries are always easy. You can have an area that's 90% German and 10% Polish, and then you can have an area that's 50-50, and then you can have an area that's 75-85, to and they can have areas that are islands that are isolated, right? You can have certain, it's not uncommon to have particular cities that had high German populations, but where the hinterland around them did not and vice versa. And so the solution here is quite tricky, but the Allies had decided that they wanted to create a state of Poland, that they wanted to create a Czechoslovakia. And the the reason given was that, well, we want to help these ethnic groups, uh, that they deserve to have a country, especially the Poles, but also the Czechs um, and the Latvians, Lithuanians, and Estonians also, although they don't play quite as an important role in what have followed as these other larger groups. But one of the other main reasons was a desire to limit the potential power of Germany, to surround Germany with these other states. The victors in World War I, and this is understandable in a point, to a point, really viewed Germany as just a potential rival. Uh, actually, the author here, Schultz Ronhoff, got interested in this topic when he was in the uh, West German military. He was studying uh, like the logistical planning uh, that the Western countries had done between the wars um, in the 20s and 30s and was amazed to the degree at which they frankly admitted that the entire point of their military was to wage war against Germany. Um, one of the other parts of the Treaty of Versailles, once it was signed, was that the victim, that all the powers would reduce their militaries. And there was some of this. We had some substantive reductions in the Navy, say, between the U.S. and the U.K., uh, some reduction in air forces. There obviously was demobilization to a point. But soon thereafter, many of these states began to remobilize and to uh, continue to, not remobilize, but to continue to develop and grow their militaries and not to set limits. Uh, and Germany found itself in a position where it was completely prostrate um, to its neighbors. Uh, he goes through the, the various years, the number of divisions that surround Germany, the number of divisions in Germany, and there were times when the ratio was 100 to 1. Uh, and Hitler, to, for his part, when he came to power, was actively talking. All weekend long, was the press saying that last week was oh, no. Donald Trump's worst week ever? I guess it's his last week, worst week. Uh, one which was the week before that, and yeah. and um, Hiller was trying to go to these other countries and say, "Well, we'll, we'll let's come to an agreement." And he would, you know, offer uh, that uh, the German Wehrmacht would only be some fraction of the size of the French military or the British military. He offered the British that the uh, um, Kriegsmarine be um, 35% the size of the Royal Navy and never more. Uh, similar ratios to the French. These were ratios that would have made defense possible, but made offense very difficult for Germany. And none of these countries were okay with that. They all wanted to have a free hand to expand their militaries more, to develop their militaries more, to develop their air forces more. He talked about, um, you know, abolishing air forces, abolishing submarines, abolishing all these other things. And I, you know, I think I'd have to study Hitler a lot more. It's amazing how these extremely famous his, historical figures are sometimes the least understood. Um, and we just kind of look at them in a, in a really cartoonish way. Uh, Hitler was not a pacifist. He obviously was not a good guy. Um, Ronhoff is not here to exonerate his, Hitler of every crime, only of some crimes. Um, you know, whatever he says in this book... It, doesn't justify what happened in the war after it began. Um, doesn't even justify everything that happened before the war began. 
Um, but if you read Mein Kampf, Hitler did not think of war as a good thing. He thought that since it killed people who were part of his race, that it was a bad thing. Um, he just thought that it was necessary sometimes for certain political ends, that it could be used in certain situations, which is something that basically everyone believed. Now, the U.S. intervened for its interest in Latin America constantly. The British did so in their empire constantly. The French did so in their empire constantly. Um, the British had an automatic antipathy against Germany because they figured it was against their interest for there to be a hegemon in Europe. Okay, fair enough. You know, maybe we can say that's a dumb idea, maybe not, but we can't say that Germany is unique here in its willingness to use um, uh, martial means to achieve its political ends. You know, and he believed in autarky, the idea that you have a government, a state that is large enough to have economies of scale. And, you know, as free trading ca capitalists, like we don't agree with that, but that was pretty much the norm back then. People in America believe that, people in Britain believe that, people in France believe that. And people in Germany believe that too, and they believe that while well, this entitled them either to uh, areas in Southeast Europe or and and this is this single term Lebensraum is is the one that indicts the Nazis the most. But in Mein Kampf, it's extremely vague what that what specifically they meant. In the book, he goes through um, Hitler's references to it, and it's very unclear that he had any kind of plan about where he wanted once the war with the soviet union began you know they they definitely said okay we want ukraine and whatnot but in my conference and he talks about poland only twice and he basically says the poles have a right to exist the poles are have all the uh traits that entitle them to a nation state and you know all best of luck to them not uh, they're in the way of uh, hegemonic power they want to have uh, many germans thought that the the trick here would be the colonies and so uh, this is something that he didn't harp on all the time, but there was oftentimes, and especially in the communication with the British, there would be, well, let's bring this discussion back up about the German colonies. There have been German colonies in Africa uh, prior to the First World War that had been taken by the French and the British. Uh, and so it's probably at least as likely that that was considered the idea for Lebensraum the, and, and not uh, the Ukraine. Um, and it was kind of argued, well, well, if we're not allowed to have Africa back, then maybe we can have uh, some kind of compensation in Eastern Europe, maybe. So he goes through the diplomatic scheming of, of the powers. Um, one of the worst elements of this was the use of the Poles. And the Poles were um, quite nationalistic and aggressive and coercive with their neighbors, not just Germany, but um, all of their neighbors, basically. Um, and they were used quite um, quite pitilessly by the British and the French. Uh, the British and the French decided after what happened with the um, annexation of Czechoslovakia, which is the element of this that probably gives the most guilt to Hitler. You know, so the sequence of events here is you have the Anschluss with Austria, and he points out that the Austrians had been trying to join the German Reich all along. They had par been part of a German Reich prior to World War One, not the one uh, that was the House of Hohenzollern, not the that one, but the you know the the half House of Habsburg, and they naturally thought, well, maybe we should re reunite with Germany, and this was not allowed by the Allies, but eventually this happens. Uh, the Anschluss was fairly popular. Uh, I, I don't think that there's any argument that the Nazis faked those elections. Then you have the issue with the Sudeten Germans. These are Germans who lived in Czechoslovakia. And the earliest records of there being a problem, you know, the way it's portrayed in documentaries today is that this was all a contrivance that was, um, uh, that Hitler kind of fostered, that he was behind the you know the he he created this this problem as a pretext for taking over you know Czechoslovakia and that doesn't seem to be the case um, the plight of the the Sudeten Germans were having their own problems and being quite vocal about them long before Hitler ever mentioned them there's no record of Hitler talking about this to his staff or in any papers or any speeches uh, and we have already a crisis in Czechoslovakia.
with the treatment of the Sudeten Germans by the majoritarian Czechs. Um, now later, um, since revising the borders to include these German populations was part of the anti-Versailles platform of the Nazis, uh, you know, Hitler took up the cause of the Sudeten Germans and they eventually reached an agreement at Munich. And, you know, the Allies accepted that agreement not because they were terrified that Germany would go to war, but they were basically agreeing that like, well, they have a case here, they have an argument. Um, now, Hitler agreed that he would never take Czechoslovakia after that, and nine months later he did. And so that was proved to be either he lied or he went back on his word either way. Um, in some of the speeches to his generals, he basically made it sound like that was pretty much it as far as he was concerned in terms of territorial acquisitions, that and the Danzig question. And this was the probably the thing that gave the French and the English the resolve that we'll go to war uh, to prevent this from happening again. Uh, Hitler is too assertive. He's too powerful. Uh, so now is the time to look for a pretext. And Poland offered a pretext. So Danzig, a German city on the coast of the Baltic Sea, uh, was given to Poland economically, although politically it was independent, it was a free city. Uh, Poland was given a port. This was, goes all the way back to Wilson had said that we should have a Polish state and the Polish state should have a port. Uh, Danzig itself wasn't a port. The Poles developed um, another port nearby as their their only, you know, uh, entry pot. And... Hitler repeatedly had tried to negotiate with the, the Poles about some kind of corridor where Germans could travel to east to and from East Prussia, from the main part of Germany, where Danzig could return politically. He always conceded that Germany sh or that Poland should keep its port and Poland should have access to this area. He conceded all of the territorial acquisitions that Poland had had at Germany's expense, something that none of the previous uh, governments before Hitler had actually done. These were areas that had been part of Prussia, that had, uh, that had been uh, part of Germany for hundreds of years, that had been given to Poland, and that had, and again, it varies in the area, like population-wise, strong arguments could be made that they should be part of Germany. And Hitler basically offered, I will concede that all those are Polish, but we need to resolve this Danzig question. Um, the French and the British basically went to the Poles and said, we will give you a guarantee. Don't negotiate on this. We will go to war for you. And it was quite cynical because they had no plans to actually help the Poles in the event of a war. This is the, the great cynical betrayal. You tell someone that you got their back, that they can go fight, you know, maybe they're about to, you tell them, hey, go in the bar, I've got your back, you can start a fight if you want. And then they go in and get killed, and you stand behind and go, oh, yeah, sorry, nothing I could do. And the French and the British are both uh, guilty of this. Um, they did nothing to ensure uh, Polish independence from Germany or from uh, independence from the Soviet Union. The supposed reason they went to war, the book makes the argument that these countries just wanted to go to war with Germany, that they were intent on going to war with Germany, that uh, they saw Germany as an economic competitor. Um, Roosevelt is a little bit farther removed in this, but there was some interesting information. Apparently, Roosevelt, uh, I don't know if it's through spy networks or what, he, I forget the details, but Roosevelt learned that Germany and the Soviet Union had made this secret agreement, which the agreement itself was publicized, but there was a secret protocol that said they would divide Poland basically 50-50. And if the Poles had known that the Russians and the or the Soviet Union and the Germans had come to this agreement, it's much more likely they would have come to the negotiating table. But Roosevelt kept that information to himself quite deliberately, probably because he wanted the Poles to go to war with Germany so that there would be a war with Germany. Um, interestingly enough, there were other um, diplomatic communications between the U.S. and Germany where the Germans would say stuff like, we want to have economic concessions in, you know, like basically bilateral trade agreements with these Eastern European countries like Yugoslavia or Hungary or uh, Romania or, uh, or Bulgaria, and we want Danzig. And the American response was, they didn't care about Danzig, but they, they did care. They were totally against these economic zones, that uh, FDR was an economic nationalist and that he used, he was against other countries having like, 
you know, competing trade agreements. But one of the, one of the few concessions that he wrung out of the British during Lend-Lease was to open up the British Commonwealth to free trade with the United States. Um, there's also some interesting stuff in there about FDR clearly looking to establish uh, the United Nations of some sort with the United States as the hegemonic head and that this was something that the British and everyone else basically uh, opposed and would not take seriously. But there's, there's quite some interesting uh, stuff in there about all that kind of um, that, that history. So, you know, he is not trying to justify what happened. He's not saying that Hitler was without fault. Certainly not, especially when it came to Czechoslovakia. Um, he talks about how in the lead up to the war, Hitler postponed the evasion at least twice, maybe three times, hoping for a diplomatic solution. Um, the British and the French were basically refusing to negotiate in good faith. They were just hoping for this war to start. They were telling the Poles that we that they don't need to negotiate because we have your back, um, which they did not actually do. They could have. It's a, you know one of those big things. If, if what if France had thrown a hundred divisions into the Ruhr, uh, you know, on September first or September second, how would history have been different? Uh, that's a really good question, but the, they they didn't do that because they had no plans of doing that. They were going to let Germany destroy Poland, and then hopefully engage in this war that they had been planning on the Maginot Line, this World War One Part Two. Um, it didn't work out so well in the end. Uh, they paid dearly for their uh, baiting of Germany in this case. So it's a fascinating book. It goes all through the first records of this, the first records of that. There's a lot of dispute about. Some of the speeches Hitler gave secretly, uh, and some of them, the provenance is questionable. Some of the stuff came up in Nuremberg, and there were questions about the authenticity or not, depending on the, depending on the speech. Uh, so really fascinating stuff, an interesting book if you want to know about the diplomatic lead up to World War II. Again, it's not an apology. It's not an. It doesn't apologize for Hitler. It just makes, as the title implies, that it's this war where there's culpability to spare. That it wasn't just one country that was involved, it was multiple. Which is, to be fair, an accurate description of the First World War also. Uh, the tendency among the victors to portray the enemy is wholly evil and the, the, the complete aggressor is often very misleading. It's not always true. There are actual aggressors out there. There are actually um, unreasonable states out there. Uh, that do unreasonable things, and it's not not very gray at all. Um, and you can say that uh, the the German invasion of Poland is is not okay; that it's a, a, a terrible war, sure. But in the context of world history at that point, it hardly stands out as particularly terrible. Right? He goes through all the other military territorial disputes that had taken place, and no one here it goes on and on about how the Poles took part of Czechoslovakia, or how the Poles took part of Lithuania or Latvia, or how the Italians had taken Abyssinia, or how the British had taken, you know, most of Africa and half of Asia, and the French had taken the other other segments. So, pretty interesting book. Uh, easy read, broken down pretty well. So, if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, take it. go ahead and check it out. All right, I'll talk to you all later.